Well, we'll uh, invite Elaine to read the scriptures and then uh, over to you, Alan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So tonight I'm reading from Luke 9, verse 57, to Luke 10, verse 4. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plough and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you, nor a traveller's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals. And don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Amen. Now, I believe I'm handing over to my fellow Scot, Alan. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sylvia. <laughs> Great. Uh, happy St George's Day, everyone. It is a joy to be with you today. Uh, I couldn't believe it when John phoned me up and asked me to speak on the 23rd of April. A Scotsman, a very proud Scotsman, being given the opportunity to preach in England on St George's Day. I thought to myself, I could have some fun with this. And then he told me it was going to be on Zoom. Even better, I thought, I don't have to plan my escape across the border after I've spoken. I couldn't believe my luck. But patron saints are really important for all countries. They, they are chosen as a, a model of virtue for people in the country to follow. They are the epitome of what a citizen is meant to become. Someone we can all look up to. Of course, in Scotland, we have the patron saint, Andrew, the first disciple of Jesus. Before that, a disciple of John, one of the first missionaries to go after uh, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. He was clearly an early adopter of ideas. And as a proud nation, we have looked to him ever since as a catalyst for doing things first. We've been great inventors in this country of Scotland. Television, telephone, Dolly the sheep, the flushing toilet, the toast of the refrigerator, penicillin, MRI scanners, fridges. Where would you be without a Scots? And, and he was a real inspiration towards these innovations. He was also an inspiration towards the Scottish missionary zeal that took Christian faith to Africa through David Livingston, who took law to Nigeria through Amy Slessor, economics to the world through Adam Smith, philanthropy through Andrew Carnegie, and so the list goes on. In, in England, you got St George as your patron saint sometime back in the ninth century. Not a disciple of Jesus, but a devout believer who was martyred in the fourth century because he refused to deny his faith. He was famed as a soldier and a great protector of people, especially, of course, against dragons with a taste for human flesh. And if I were English, with a land border to the Celtic North, then I guess I would want a dragon slayer as my patron saint to look up to and to protect me from those marauders in the North. St. George is made famous by this folk tale of slaying the dragon. And slaying dragons seems 
a bit wild these days, almost a bit unnecessary. The, the DreamWork animation studios taught us through the actions of the Viking who was called Hiccup, that we are not to slay dragons anymore. We are not to slay them, we are to train them. Indeed, not just train them, but tame the dragons. Dr deadly dragons like Night Fury are to be tamed. The unholy offspring of lightning and death itself can become your friend, is the message of how to train your dragon. My fear, my friends, is that the Baptist churches of the British Isles have become more like Hiccup than St. George in their approach to spiritual dragons. I genuinely fear that we have made friends with enemies that we should have slain. The days of Baptist defiance seem so far back in our past. The days of clandestine gatherings in caves around Zurich to sing out the praises of God amidst fear of death and community destruction. So long gone, the days of defying the established church and government and king as we fought for religious freedom in England. The days of sending our best people to foreign lands, never expecting to see them return ever again. The days when Scottish Baptists imitated the French revolutionaries handing out tracts and preaching in the fields and on the beaches in order to proclaim our faith, even though we might go to prison or experience economic persecution. Those days have gone. And in their passing, we quickly sanctified many of the trappings of those we had battled against. We have befriended ancient societal dragons, dragons that may set counter to our understanding of the church and to our understanding of the kingdom of God. And having sanctified these things, we struggle to imagine life without them. We sanctified buildings as places to proclaim the gospel when the whole of creation used to be our pulpit. We ordained our leaders for the sake of respectability, recognition and control, but at what cost? We do not believe in the priesthood of some, but the priesthood of all. But it would be hard to recognize that today when as a church we gather for communion or listen to preaching or observe a baptismal service. Our Baptist priests seem to take center stage. We brought in charitable status, replicable programs that systematically disempower God's people. We bought into the age of the expert and leadership models, which means, in actual fact, I, I can't think of one person in local church leadership teams in my sphere of influence who work in manual labor or as a care assistant or in a supermarket till. I can't recall the last time I heard somebody who worked in the supermarket preaching and sharing what God had said to them in the past week. It strikes me that the words of Mark 8 verse 36 may summarize our slow slide from dragon slayers into respectability. Unusually, I'm using the King James Version because it, it trips off my tongue, but forgive the sexism in it. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Tonight, I want to suggest that there are three dragons we need to slay to recover our soul, to recover the very essence of what it means to be a Baptist church, which I believe is exactly the model of church this nation needs at this point in history. And the first dragon is the love affair we have with respectability. During Lent, about 18 of us in the local church that I currently support as an interim minister read through the books of Luke and Acts. We were halfway through Acts. We had been reading it every day and then we would meet once a week to discuss what we had read. And I made the comment that Jesus did not appear to be very nice 
at times when you read about him in the book of Luke. There was a sigh of relief in the Zoom room that I had said it because everyone was thinking it. He rarely answered a question with a straight answer. He said things like, who are my mother and who are my brothers when they were standing at the door within earshot of him? He was heard in our reading tonight to say, let the dead bury their own dead. Who would suggest such a disgraceful act for a son? Have we become too nice? Have we become too respectable? Have we become too lukewarm? Have we lost the defiance and the dissidence of our Baptist roots? We no longer offer a distinct or credible approach to discipleship. We are more likely to seek to imitate the big successful church in London or Chicago or California than dig into our roots and grapple with the spirit of this age to discern and implement what it means to be a believer's church today in the North. Dragon one is the dragon of respectability. Dragon two is related to dragon one. He's the son of respectability and we call him control. For some reason, we think it's important to be in control of everything that is happening all of the time. Now, I'm not talking about self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the spirit. It's what we need to have in order to replace organizational control. Organizational control is tying us down and limiting our potential. We've been captured by this dragon of control and he's waiting to barbecue us. Mark Green, who spoke uh, quite recently at one of your other assemblies last year, I think it was, has spoken in the past about the bottleneck of control that uh, he perceives within the church. When everything that we think of doing has to go through this funnel of a minister or a series of committees and church meetings and how easy it can lose its potential for impact and power. Let me share an example. You are going to think this is so extreme, but it's true. It happened very recently in my own experience. A new young leader an established, of an established church project had a fresh idea, a developmental opportunity. She took it to the committee who organizes her specific ministry, and they said, yes, that's a great idea. We need to go for that, but we'll just check it out with the national body that we're associated with. So they checked it out with the national body that they were associated and they went, yes, that's a great idea. In fact, it's so great. We're going to give you some funding so that you don't have to take it out of the church accounts to do it. Just like home mission gone wild on steroids. I mean, loads of money to pay for the whole project. That was fantastic. Once the money was assured, that little committee said, now, we just need to check with the committee that sits above us in the church and supervises our ministry. So they sent it up to that committee in the local church who said, this is a great idea. We must pass it on to the church staff team and hear what the minister thinks about it. But he was busy and it was going to take a month or so. So it sat on his desk for six weeks or so. He said, this is a great idea. I absolutely love it. We should just share it with the elders to make sure they're in agreement. And so the elders heard about the idea. Of course, it took two months to get it onto their agenda because they're really busy. And when it got to their agenda, they went, yes, praise the Lord. This is fantastic. Let's just get the church meeting to affirm it. And you cannot believe it, but six weeks later, they had a church meeting to affirm the idea that had been affirmed by just about everybody in the church already in the committee stage. It was approved by the church meeting. Six months later, it then came back to the person who had had the idea. Quite frankly, she couldn't remember what the base idea was anymore. It had changed so many times in the six committees it had gone through. It was unrecognizable. The radical idea had gone. It was no longer radical. It was respectable. And all because of the sun control. The passion and drive gone. 
disempowerment of local believers because of the desire of some to control things. When Jesus sent out the 72 that we read about, he didn't say, but before you do anything, check back with me to make sure it's okay. He didn't require them to even work within the constraints of a budget. Can you believe it? He didn't even give them a budget. He told them that the harvest was massive and to get out there. And he gave them each other a self-regulating control. Two disciples to work together, to control one another, to help one another, to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in their life. They had to grow up and make mature decisions of whether to stay in that village or move on. After his risk assessment, and he did one, he said, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. He told them, this is going to be really risky, really dangerous. But hey, take the risk. Maybe you're thinking, Alan, you're sounding irresponsible. Maybe even some of the brave people there are thinking, Jesus sounds like he was being irresponsible, sending them out in pairs with nothing. Friends. How do you expect people to grow if we try to control or protect them all the time? If we slay this dragon, the whole people of God can fly. The church meeting will not be the sole expression of the priesthood of all believers. The entire life and mission of the church will be the expression of the priesthood of all believers. Please be assured, I know most of you don't know me, I'm not irresponsible. I spent 10 years as General Secretary of the Baptist Union of Scotland, ensuring that things were run with excellence. But the other aspect of my ministry was setting free an organization from unnecessary constraints. A theologian called Craig Van Gelder, historian, wrote that from the 1920s on, denominations and associations were captivated by efficiency to the extent that most growth came through what they would describe as a franchise model of church, a controlled model. All the churches were doing the same sort of things. They prepared a central curriculum for Sunday school and everybody did it. They had the same model of women's organizations, men's organizations, syllabuses for them, common hymn books. In Scotland, if you built a church in the 1960s or 1970s, it was the same architect's plans every single time. There was no local influence upon it. I spent 10 years encouraging creativity at a local level encouraging the artists and the entrepreneurs that remained in our churches because most had left because of the dragon of control. We need to be encouraging church leaders to release people into their passion. In other words, to become Baptist in our practice of the priesthood of all believers. I interviewed Professor John Drain a few years ago, and on that occasion, the most significant statement he made was this. If leaders release control, I think the church might grow exponentially. It's one of the most baptistic things I've ever heard said. This is what we believe as Baptist churches. We need to set God's people free. Jim Taylor was the president of the Baptist Union of Scotland in 1972, 49, nearly 50 years ago. His sermon title back then was Abolish the Laity. Abolish the Laity. We are all priests, all ministers, and we all need the freedom and expectation that we will go into all the world. Dragon 2 has us tied up like a spit roast pig over a barbecue. And we need to slay the dragon of control. Now, I only have time to speak of one last dragon, and I'll keep it really, really short. It's probably the most controversial. The dragon that I want to slay is the dragon of mission. Let me explain what I mean. And I think you better see my face on the screen as I say it so that you understand it. This word mission is not our word. It's taken me over a decade from first being confronted with this concept to accepting it. 
the former Scottish Baptist College principal, uh, Jim Gordon, suggested to me that we should ditch the word mission back in 2010. I felt it was impossible. How could you ditch the word mission? The missional movement was on the rise. Mission statements were really important to large churches. But I think in the long term, he was right. Language matters. And this word mission blots out a better word. Mission creates missionaries, and we are not them. Missionaries are somebody else. Mission creates missions, special times when we proclaim the gospel. And we don't do missions. We don't have a week when we explain the gospel, and if you don't meet that week, you have to wait another 51 until you can hear the gospel. Mission creates societies who quickly lose touch with the local church. Mission for me is a, is a struggling church hall building in our community that had its day in the 1960s and 70s and reaching out to the working class and is struggling to hold on like some form of church, but it's a mission. Mission is not our word. Witness is our word. In your declaration of principle as an association, it says that it is the duty of every disciple to bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to take part in the evangelization of the world. Witness is something every one of us does without a choice. We are all witnesses to our faith all of the time for good or for bad. The Bible calls us to be witnesses. Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. William James McClendon Jr., one of the greatest Baptist theologians in his systematic theology says, witness is a story being lived out by those who know it best. That is us. Living out the gospel story day in, day out. That's what we are called to do when Jesus commissions us with the words, as you are going, make disciples. That's what disciples do as they go. That's what they do when they arrive in the village with their buddy holding their hand, going, what are we doing here without staff or purse and not knowing anybody? They only have a story to tell. They can only say peace to this village and pray for healing and the kingdom of God to come as they eat and drink with these new unbelieving neighbors. I wonder if you're willing to join me in slaying the dragon of mission so that we can embrace the calling to be witnesses. I've suggested three things that we need to slay. The dragon of respectability, of control, and the word mission. These are not the only dragons out there. So in a few seconds, when you go into your groups, you might want to ask this first question. What other dragons would we add to the list? What other dragons need slaying? And why? What other dragons have tied up the churches and constrained their future potential? Second question, if we are to emphasize the priesthood of all believers, what will we need to do to resurrect the impact, influence, and opportunity in the roles of those we set apart by the laying on of hands? For the most part, we call them ministers. Sometimes we call them pioneers, community workers, youth workers, chaplains, pastors. We have all sorts of words for those people we set apart by the laying on of hands. And the third question, what steps can be taken to rediscover the power of witness in our churches? What steps can we be taken to rediscover the power of witness in our churches. I'm going to leave you in small groups to discuss these questions. And then I think in about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, uh, we'll meet back together again. When John contacted me, he asked me to speak on the theme 
of transformation. And it's one of my favorite topics, one of my favorite activities. I, I get energized, as you can tell, uh, by the topic, by the process, maybe inspired by my patron, St. Andrew, to be an early adopter of change and innovation. In a natural way, it's really easy for me to be in the place of transformation, even more so than a place of change, or even worse, that word that I dread hearing in church, consolidation. I know it has a place, it just, I, not in my life it doesn't, it makes me squirm. Why do we need to slay things that have served us in the past? It's a genuine question. Why do we need to look to our deep roots and ancient traditions and not to our recent ones? Another reasonable question. Why do we need to be transformed and not just change some things? Well, I think the answer to these questions lie in something that has been happening in the UK for hundreds of years, with only a few exceptions. And the words I want to use to describe it are this, prolonged equilibrium. We have been living through a time of prolonged equilibrium. We are suffering and failing to thrive in part because of this. Things have not changed within our society for quite literally hundreds of years. Since the formation and acceptance of Baptist churches into this nation, there's been relative political stability. The centrality of the Church of England as a state church, there's been a whole Christendom package going on that spread across Western civilization. And we've experienced a prolonged period of stability, which we have benefited from greatly. But what that prolonged period of equilibrium does is it dulls your senses to significant environmental changes round about you. The world has changed significantly, even in the last 60 years, but we in the church have hardly changed at all in response. We still meet on the same day, at the same time, in the same place, in some cases with the same furniture, doing the same things in only slightly different ways from how our great-grandparents did. And one of the things that prolonged the period of equilibrium, or one of the consequences of that prolonged period of equilibrium, is that it has masked a sense of decline in our churches. I haven't looked at the figures for Baptists in the north of England, but the Baptist churches in Scotland have been declining for the last 60 years, with the exception of two in the 1980s. And the rate of decline is around 1% per annum. That means in most churches, in the average church, the decline is one person every two years. That's not noticeable. In small churches, the decline is one person every three or four years. An average church of 70 has declined to 35 over 60 years. Two generations of the body of Christ for it to half. Therefore, we barely notice. Who would notice one person left less in your church over two years? Had it happened overnight, these changes, and it may well be happening overnight right now, had it happened overnight, I am certain we would have reacted strongly and with great creativity. But the sense of equilibrium has dulled our senses to what has been happening. Now, death and decay in the church is a natural thing because the church is a living thing. The church is a body. It's a bride. It's a vine. It exists within the world's living environment. The church and its environment are subject to the natural, natural order present in this world as impacted by the fall. We have, like the environment around us, or like our breath overnight, a predisposition to decay. The church that doesn't recognize that and recognize that the world around it is dying and changing and its environment has changed just dies a little bit quicker. The churches that hang on in there, and some even grow, are the churches that are adapting to the new environment that they face around them. Uh, the difficulty we face in Scotland, and I believe in the northeast of England, is the environmental change in our part of the world has been particularly slow. If you go to the cities of London, there are big inputs of people from other parts of the world who come, and the Windrush generation arrives, and the city changes, and everybody knows it's changed. In Scotland, 
it just drifts along from day to day. And I wonder if that's the same for you guys in the Northeast. It, it may be that COVID is the thing that has shaken us up, that is giving us the opportunity amongst the desperate sadness of the circumstances, an opportunity for change. And right now, as an association, an opportunity to explore the environmental changes that we're facing today as a society. Slay the dragons and seek no change. Change is another dragon I'd want to slay, but seek transformation. Most of our churches need significant innovation, not a little bit of renovation. In many cases, our life is dependent on our willingness to die. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat fall to the earth and dies, it remains only a single seed. He used the statement to prophesy his own death and then resurrection, but it also marks a pattern for Christian living. We must deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. The task was so important, Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I ask the question for your discussion, what is the role of the ordained minister today in our churches? To shortcut the question. There are many roles, but one I believe is to walk the church through the valley of the shadow of death so that it might discover life. To give the church confidence to slay the dragons that have shaped its identity and discover a new identity hidden deep in the roots of our faith and practice. It is to give the people of God a sense of freedom and a permission to go to surrender control. It is to remind them that they are deployed by God, not by some program developed in some distant church. It is to teach them that if they grapple with the struggles of the new cultures that we find ourselves located within, and if they struggle with the scriptures and they struggle with the person of Christ, they will find ways of glorifying the Father, of revealing the Son as they experience the Spirit moving in and through them. The church is a living thing with a predisposition to decay, but when it enters the valley of the shadow of death willingly, resurrection can be discovered. When it chooses to walk towards its own death in faith, as it enters that place of chaos, the place of not knowing, the place of greatest potential destruction, it actually enters the place of greatest opportunity. A place akin to the Easter weekend, which finishes and flourishes with resurrection. The crowds can call for the death of the church like they call for the death of a saviour. But if we choose to walk the chaotic, self-emptying path as a community, we enter the place of greatest opportunity. A place where frustration and agitation can give way to innovation, resurrection, new hope and new life. Let me give you one example. It starts back in the 1960s. It was already mentioned. I was once minister at Dumfries Baptist Church. Dumfries Baptist Church in the 1960s made a decision that after years of struggling to keep the church going, they would close they decided that if God did not move in miraculous ways amongst them in the coming year, that the decision was being made tonight to close in exactly one calendar year from this day. It didn't require the decision to be made again in a year's time. That decision was made. We are closing in one year's time unless a miracle happens. They held morning services and met for prayer. Nothing else for that year. And in that year, the 16 people who were left in that church discovered other Christians moving into the area and joining them. And when they discovered a blank canvas, no church activities, nothing making people busy, they started to dream and imagine what they might do. By the end of that year, when they were going to do nothing and cleared the decks, they had doubled in number. They continued to grow over the years, they had me as minister and others as minister, like Alistair Purse, who some of you know. They recently built a church building that cost 5 million people, seats 500 people, and is currently a COVID vaccination centre. It's a church that faced death and in facing death found new life. 
Survival thinking closes our imagination, folks. It reduces risk taking. And no wonder, because it's contrary to the cross. We must choose the way of the cross. We must choose the way of the vine keeper. Let us enter into his pruning and his cutting out with a desire to discover the riches of a fruitful vine. Let's do like the 72 and accept the appointment as witnesses to Christ and his coming kingdom. Let's slay the dragons we have befriended and embrace the journey that though it descends into chaos, it will rise in glory. Amen. Amen.